There's another layer of significance to Octavius's lines, the time of universal peace is near. Prove this a prosperous day, the three-nooked world shall bear the olive freely. That extra dimension is this. Antony and Cleopatra was written during the reign of King James. King James was the patron of Shakespeare's acting company. They were the king's men. And Shakespeare wrote the play in the knowledge that there would be an expectation that it would be performed at court in front of King James. Now, King James very strongly identified with Augustus Caesar. Augustus, the name that Octavius took once he was imperial ruler of the whole empire following the death of Antony. Why did James see himself as a modern Augustus? Well, the question of universal peace has a great deal to do with it. He knew very well about the Pax Augusta that we've just been talking about, and he saw it as his role to bring to Europe a similar peace. We should never forget that for the first half of Shakespeare's career, he was a war poet. England was at war with Spain. Shakespeare entered the theatre world around the time of the Armada. He wrote his English history plays, such as Henry V, at a time when war with Spain was ongoing, sometimes fought in the form of proxy wars, as in the Netherlands, and sometimes complicated by the process of rebellion in Ireland. When King James came to the throne, he made it his business to bring the long war with Spain to an end. One of the first things that he initiated was a peace conference at Somerset House in London. Fascinatingly, Shakespeare's acting company, who were now the King's men and had the formal title of grooms of the royal chamber, had to attend the peace conference. Presumably, they had to shut down the theatre, stop playing their, their, their plays so that they could be in attendance. One imagines that because there was a large delegation of Spanish diplomats engaging in the peace process, that a large number of staff were needed to look after them. We don't know whether any little informal plays were put on during the course of the, of the negotiations, but we do know that the peace agreement was completed. The other thing that James was much preoccupied with was, of course, religion. He was fascinated by questions of theological doctrine and early in his reign he called a second conference which was a conference of all the bishops of the church and the great theologians of the day. That led eventually to the publication of the great book of his age, the King James translation of the Bible. The bishops were commissioned to go off and create a new translation of the Bible. The idea of the King's J King James Version was in many ways to reconcile the different religious factions of the age. So the Geneva Bible was an extreme Protestant version. There was also a Catholic Bible. The King James Bible tried to steer a middle course. So in terms of both religious dispute and the politics of Europe, James saw himself as a peacemaker. Unlike Queen Elizabeth, who had no children, King James did have a family. His wife was Danish, and that was another alliance for him. And soon he set about marrying off his children in order to make more diplomatic alliances and to try to secure peace across Europe. In 1616, the year of Shakespeare's death, King James's literary works were published in a handsome folio volume. Just have a look at the title page. It's formed like an imperial triumphal arch from ancient Rome, a piece of classical architecture, a piece of celebration, the kind of archway that a great general would have returned, would have, would have travelled through on his return to Rome after a conquest. And between pillars on the archway are two fine classical looking figures. On the left 
is one holding a book, clearly alluding to the King James Bible, called Religio, religion. But on the right, holding the cornucopia, which is the sign of fertility and peace. On the right is a figure called Pax, Pax, the Latin word for peace. The time of universal peace is near. Prove this a prosperous day, and the three-nooked world shall bear the olive freely. This is Octavius Caesar becoming Augustus, and in some senses becoming King James. What is so striking, though, about the way that Shakespeare writes Antony and Cleopatra is that Octavius is not a particularly sympathetic character. Although the play ends with this reference to his becoming Augustus and to the world peace that James had signed up for, in the play as a whole, we have much more sympathy with the flawed Antony and the alluring Cleopatra. It's a tribute to the world of Shakespeare that he was allowed to put on a play that was so questioning of the figure of Octavius. A tribute too to King James that he seems to have enjoyed plays that asked difficult political questions. And of course, although it's extraordinarily helpful in our understanding of Shakespeare's plays to know a little bit of the context, to know that a phrase like the time of universal peace had a particular resonance when the play was written. Despite all that, we don't ultimately want to simply identify Octavius with King James. Shakespeare never wrote that sort of simple political allegory. He kept at a distance from topicality, and that's one of the things that meant that his plays could be performed in later ages. It's one of the things that mean that his plays are universal. However much we benefit from learning about Shakespeare's world and Shakespeare's understanding of the ancient world of Egypt and Rome, still the plays speak to the modern world, to our world. If that word universal suggests anything in a Shakespearean context, it is the universal applicability and appeal of Shakespeare's plays.